Lord God, you know how far I am from my best this day. And so I pray that the power of your spirit would be active in our midst to far make, uh, to far transcend my limitations and to more than make up the difference. We do love you. It is our privilege to know you and serve you. And it's in the name of our precious Savior and exalted Lord Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. I do indeed love the Christmas season, in part because it provides an opportunity to preach with the backdrop of the world's largest Christmas tree, which is uh, good, good. But I mostly love Christmas because it reminds me of who I am, by which I mean whose I am. I don't know if your family has holiday traditions that reinforce and reestablish identity, but I really can't think of Christmas without thinking of some of the family rituals that defined the Christmases of my childhood. At least once a year, the entirety of the Bryan clan, my mother's side of the family, would gather at 127 South Main Street in Paris, Missouri, for a little exercise in identity reinforcement via ritual. Uh, Once a year, I would have ham purchased from the Paris IGA. It had a taste, it had an aroma to it that you cannot find in any other pig in any other place. When I think of these events, I think of, I think of the only time per year when I would eat oyster casserole. Why would anyone eat oyster casserole baked in this Pyrex dish covered with a covering, an atonement covering <laughs> of saltine crackers, only, only because it was an exercise in learning and identity reinforcement. But I mostly think, when I think of the Christmases of my childhood, about a ritual, a rhythm put in place by my grandmother, who every year designed a Christmas program for our entire family to celebrate together. And it was an entire Brian family event. It might be the only time all year that my very small Brian family family even got together. But everybody participated in this event. If you were too young to read, you would take a Christmas postcard and describe it. These are, in fact, the first sermons I ever preached. It's like a Middle Ages preacher just pointing at the picture and explaining it. And as I grew older, not only did I do that, but I, my my, my cousin and I might only see my cousin once a year, but we would bring our trumpets, our junior high band trumpets, and play what, what shall I call this, music? <laughs> that attempted to somehow honor God. And I learned that joyful noises are not always vocalized. They are, in fact, sometimes trumpetized. It was then that I was reminded that I do not really come from a family of especially careful verbalizers. We would pass family Bibles around the circle 
and we would read together the Christmas story. I remember the year my, my grandfather, my grandpa Brian, got stuck with the King James Version. And he was wandering his way through Luke. And he came to the point where he was to describe Mary's marital status. And he said, and she was be, and she was be, and she was be, and whispering a barely audible expletive, he said, she was engaged. <laughs> and it spoke so much to my grandmother's resolute determination to remind and reinforce. We are many things as the Bryan family, but we are first and we are foremost a people of the story. And sometimes you need to remember that when the story starts to get blurred or when your own story starts to get painful. It was seventh grade, December, my seventh grade year. The last time I wore glasses that looked like this, it was the Christmas of my seventh grade year that the time came for my mother to read her Christmas poem. A Christmas poem from Ideals Magazine where we only went for bad sentimental poetry <laughs> once a year. But when we went there, we went big. And as the Ideals Magazine was passed around the room, we came to my mother's turn, the lifelong member of the Bryan family. She started to try to read the poem, and she began to cry. And she walked out of the room, now what do you do? It's not the time to pull the trumpets back out and break into a really lousy rendition of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So we did the only thing we knew to do. Picked up the King Jimmy and we dove back into the story. Do you know when Christmas became a federal holiday in this country? It was the year 1870. President Grant, dealing with a group of people who had been sort of rather vigorously contending over whose freedoms mattered most, I thought, we've got to get this thing back together. We have skirmished. We have skirmished on Christmas. And the, and the Christmas of 1862, when one group of soldiers decided to serenade one another on Christmas Day before slaughtering one another the next day, was at best, at best, a painful pointing in the right direction. And so, leading a group of people, each of whom had pointed to the story in an effort to identify their story. 
President Grant said, I guess we better make this a federal holiday because pointing in the direction of the story is the only shot we got. Christmas is about the reinforcing, the reestablishing of identity. And therefore, how you connect to the story defines who you are and how you celebrate the story if you celebrate the story demonstrates who you are. Which is why I'm really glad this morning to have an opportunity to talk about the good news according to Moses because it takes us to the book of Exodus, a place where we really might not seem at first blush to belong unless, of course, you've been reading your Bible. Because to try to talk about the Christmas story without talking about the book of Exodus is to, in fact, miss one of the primary ways that the gospel writers, that the biblical writers talk about the Christmas story itself. If we were to go to Matthew's gospel to talk about the Christmas story, we would see the good news according to Moses. Why? Because on the other side of the genealogy, you get this emphatic book-ending statement to Matthew's gospel that Christmas is about God with us. And you don't have God with us if you don't have the book of Exodus. What's the book of Exodus about? God with us. Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, tabernacle, heaven intersecting earth. What is that if it is not God with us? Mark Mark, well, he sort of starts with Genesis, but once you get past in the beginning, you get to what? You get to Isaiah chapter 40. I thought we were in Exodus. We are. Why? Because Isaiah, in presenting his portrait in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, a messenger, a messenger from God that is going to make straight paths. We quote Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah is alluding to Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Where God, on the other side of freeing and declaring for himself a people, God on the other side of the Ten Commandments. God immediately prior to chapter 24 and Sinai in the establishing of a covenant and the sprinkling of blood everywhere says, here is my messenger. Your English Bible probably translates it angel. And that's why you don't see the verbal similarity between Exodus 23 and Isaiah 40. Read the rest of Isaiah, you'll see a lot more Exodus there. Even Mark's Christmas story has a good news according to Moses all over it. John, John, we go to John and we see Genesis. John sees Genesis. But John sees Exodus. Could John really, could John really have made statements about how in Jesus of Nazareth we have beheld the glory of God? We have seen his glory. Could God really answer the show me your glory prayer? And have people not think of Exodus. 
But this year I find myself especially thinking of Luke. I was tempted to stay in all the festivals and and Passover and such related to John as Jesus self-defines himself as the fulfillment of Jewish ritual reinforcement through holiday celebration. I was tempted to stay there. But I got hung up in Luke. Luke. Where the power of God is unleashed on behalf of oppressed people, his oppressed people, that they might be set free. Why did I go there? Because Exodus, Exodus is about a story of liberation. I'm supposed to give you the gospel according to Moses. So you want the gospel according to Moses? Here's the gospel according to Moses. Read Christianly. Jesus is a new Moses who is taking a new Israel, that is, his church, and he is releasing them from slavery and bondage to the present world order in order to take him to a place of rest that is never-ending liberation. There is the gospel according to Moses. And frankly, since I don't feel very good today, I'm tempted to sit down and shut up. But of course, I'm a preaching professor around here, which means even when I'm sick, I can go for about 76 minutes. (laughs) Got to thinking about this concept of liberation in relationship to identity. And maybe it was the General Ulysses S. Grant bit that got me started on this. But I got to thinking about how much identity language in the story, that story, this story, how much of that language takes me back to the earliest days of Greek class when I learned the word doulos. Beginning Greek students, can I get a witness? From your earliest exposure to the Greek text from the first days when you realized, by golly, the Bible's not an English book. You hear the word doulos. Slave. Bond servant. You know, I've spent half my life trying to understand the first Greek words I ever learned. Agape. For goodness sakes, I came to Ozark, wasn't even sure where you read about Moses. Even I had heard of agape. Still trying to work on that one. Just because you can define it doesn't mean you can define it. Shortly thereafter, do loss. And you think I'd have that one down. It's deeply woven into the story. John McKay, an Old Testament scholar, wrote an article in Theology Today Journal, 1958, 1959, arguing that the servant slave vocabulary of the Bible is, in fact, the defining imagery of the Bible itself. Now, I don't know what you think of that statement. I'd like to quibble with it a little, but I've got to admit, it is all over the story. It is. Because the book of Exodus, the gospel according to Moses, the gospel for them, the gospel for us, is a story that starts with a do-loss word. 
a word of enslavement. It shows up in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis. But what happens there is pretty tame. But what happens once the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph places a people in Egypt under a king who does not know Joseph? Turns the terminology on its head. These people, the descendants of Abraham, become do lost. You know the story. You've heard the story. You've read the story. By now at this point in the semester, you've been tested over the story. Bricks, more bricks, more bricks. Let my people go. Bricks without straw. More bricks without straw. Why? Because even the Egyptians knew that somehow the city sparkles a little more when your monuments have been built off the glistening sweat of someone else's brow. Tombs to store your stuff. Store cities to store your stuff. Do lots. A story of slavery. Now, you know where it goes from there. One little, two little, three little bad plagues. Four little, five little, six little bad plagues. Let my people go. Don't believe so. Seven little, eight little, nine little bad plagues. Yeah, I think I will. No, I've changed my mind. Tenth plague, go. No, actually, don't. Because the words of Pharaoh in Exodus 14 Shall I really lose the doulossing of these doulossers? Slavery. That's not your story. Oh, really? It's how the Bible conceptualizes bondage from that point forward in the Old and New Testament scriptures so that even when later generations of Israelites become bonded, bound to the twin towers, the twin powers of idolatry and immorality, and therefore go off into captivity, even Isaiah, even Isaiah will frame up their bondage in just these kinds of ways. But perhaps the most familiar place is Paul, Romans chapter 6, where the doulos vocabulary of the New Testament is compressed about as much as you're going to find per square inch in your entire Bible. As a reminder that you and I, Romans 6, 20, and 21, were slaves, slaves to sin. You remember? I bet if you look around hard enough, you can still see a few scars. But some of you who went home for Thanksgiving break had a little bit of dread on the trip home because of reminders of bondage from years gone by. I bet some of the oldest people in this room who can't remember much well can still remember that better than they wish they could. Bondage. You were a slave. I was a slave. Bricks without straw. Give me bricks without straw a billion times over compared to the captivity I have known. You there? Bondage. Do loss. Slave. Enslaved. 
But the gospel according to Moses is that do loss can be de do lost. You know the story. You've been tested over the story. A God who can create, a God who can separate land from water, can bring water back over land, who with a strong east wind, have you noticed how little the text says about God's delivering activity in Exodus 14? Moses spends as much time telling Israel to stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord as he spends describing what God did to deliver them in the first place. Strong east wind, back go the waves, across go the people, down come the waves, down go the Egyptians. God's people did do lost. Miriam grabbed the tambourine and let's all pull a hamstring in the name of Yahweh as we celebrate. <laughs> but even there is the language of slavery because to be de do lost requires a do loss. If you were to look at the Septuagint of Exodus chapter 14, you would see that the Israelites quarreled with God's servant Moses. They said to Moses, Moses, why did you get us here with the sea in front of us and mountains on each side? Oh, that we could go back and do loss our way across Egypt, bricks without straw. But after a strong east wind, the last verse of Exodus chapter 14 says that after God threw it down, by his strong right arm and the staff of Moses, that the people trusted God's slave, Moses. A slave to deliver slaves out of a palace? Could it be? Oh, I think it could. I think it could. I think it could because Paul in Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 describes one equal to God who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but took the form of a do loss. And even the woman God used to bring him into the world said in response to an angelic birth announcement, I am the Lord's feminine form of doulos and repeats it later in the same passage. You were a slave, but you've been de lost by a doulos. And you know what that makes you? That makes you a doulos. No, really. Because on the other side of the celebration, on the other side of the commands and the very reason for the commands that you memorized in OT history is God's statement to this effect. I have liberated you. You are mine. By which I mean you are mine. So in case you missed it, the Egyptian firstborn died you think that means your firstborn get to sit around playing backgammon? No. Exodus 13, they are mine. Why? Because you are mine. Now, wait a minute. I thought you set us free. I did. Freedom biblically is not just freedom from, it's freedom to. There's a lot of theology in the Bible carried on prepositions. Prepositions are sort of the ants of words. They're little bitty, and they carry huge quantities of freight. You're not just saved from, you are saved to. That's the whole point of how this fits together as it relates to your identity. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's Christmas. I don't want to be a do-loss. I thought you said Christmas is about identity. It is. I thought you said I'm a slave. You are. Well, how does that all fit together? I mean, like slaves, slaves don't actually have their own distinct identity. I mean, slaves only have the identity that they are granted by their master. They only have identity in relationship to their master. They do. I thought you said I'm a slave. You are. 
The Bible says everybody is enslaved by something. You're either enslaved by the dominion of darkness or you are in slavery to God. That means somebody defines and determines your identity. You say, but wait a minute. That sort of sounds like a derogatory sort of identity to have. Ooh, the gospel according to Moses, the gospel according to Jesus is doulos redefined. Do you realize that the very term bond servant, the very term slave becomes a title of honor? It's applied to Jesus. It's applied to Moses. It's applied to David. It's applied to the prophets. It's applied to Mary. Paul applies it to himself over and over and over, as does Peter, and it applies to you too. And friends, I'm here to say to you that the message of due loss is good news to you today. It is good news to you today. It means that as one who belongs to God, in the words of Paul, you are no longer a slave to sin, you are a slave to God. That is in the text, Romans 6, 22. And because you are a slave to God, you are a slave to righteousness. And that means everything. Slavery is redefined, addiction is redefined. For all your forever, you've thought that the only thing addictive is greed. And now you discover generosity can be addictive. You thought the only thing that could be addictive was to use your power to objectify. All of a sudden, you discover it is incredibly addictive to use your power to honor. You thought that the only thing that could addict was the power of darkness. And the message of Moses is that slavery is redefined. And because of the one to whom you belong, your identity and the way you live it out is forever changed. And that means as you go about living what it means to serve, that even if, even if you walk down into the Ambassadome someday, and discover that the good people of Ozark Christian College have not yet got around to framing your face. That there's a day in which you will hear, well done, good and faithful slave. I've got a real hunch that on that day, it's not going to sound to you like a word of bad news. You were a slave. But because you've been deslaved by a slave, you are a slave. And you know, the crazy thing about that, you're always going to be one. The language of Exodus is all over the language of the book of Revelation. The language of liberation in Revelation is the language of Exodus. The language of the church articulating God's message in the meantime is the language of Exodus. The language of vindication and celebration in Revelation 15 is the song, the new song of God's people described in the text as the song of my do loss. Moses. And so in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, verse 6, the way God's people are described in forever fellowship and forever worship of him, the verb for service is the verb for worship. But the noun that describes the worshiper is due loss. Could it be? Could it really be that there is a place so pure that what I always thought was a chain is nothing but a tether? And where due loss is so in Christ not only redefined, but re-experienced. The do loss 
can be better than I ever imagined? That's how the story ends. That's how the story begins. The gospel of Moses, the gospel of Christ, your forever. Man, I don't know about you, but if God can actually not only redefine slavery, but transform it, man, that's like good news.